Welcome, deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. All right, welcome back to the Deer University podcast. I am here with Deer Guru, Steve Damaris. Um, And today we are going to talk a little bit about deer movements. And it's that time of year, Steve, where um, people, of course, well, in, in some parts of the country, they've already been deer hunting. But in other parts, like here in Mississippi, we're getting ready to to go hunting and a lot of people are looking at their trail cam photos and basically trying to figure out where am I going to hunt where am I going to put the stand etc and so I guess what we wanted to accomplish with this episode is kind of go through biologically the the classifications or types of movement that deer exhibit all throughout the year speaking of movement I'm glad to be back with you, Bronson. It's been a while. I've missed several episodes because of movement. I've been moving around a lot. You've been moving around a lot. You've been up to Maine, had a guest speaker up in Maine, and I wasn't there to enjoy that down home, uh, down Maine flavor. Uh, I've been in Colorado and Texas and, and different places. You've been different places. So short answer is sure is good to be done with our movement for a while and, and be here talking about It's been about a deer. really busy summer. It was all good. It was all fun. But uh, unfortunately, it kept us from doing this. And so now we're kind of catching up and getting a few episodes recorded. Yeah. So, Steve, let, let's get to the topic of movements. Um, how would you classify the different types of deer movements? Well, the, you have to think about it from the standpoint of the needs of the animal, I, th- I think. And so the first thing I think about is the general life of an animal is where does it live what's its home range where where does it live and and what are the areas that it normally goes around and and does its day-to-day living in kind of like you know where do what's our home range here in starkville we have a home range and and every once in a while we'll make these excursions and we'll talk excursions Uh, uh, a little bit like how you work that in there yeah so the home range is just the area that an animal spends most of its time in uh, fulfilling its life needs to get food, cover, and water. Yep, during any specified amount of time. Typically, we talk about annual home range, but we talk about hunting season or, or pre-rut, rut, post-rut home ranges. So, you know, biologists, and scientists can break them up into any time frame, but it's just a matter of all the area that an animal lives in during a specified amount of time. Uh, okay, so why don't we go through? We are. I guess technically we're end of summer, um, fall is right around the corner. What are bucks doing right now? Right now, they're antler-wise, they're finishing their antler growth. They're actually, they've completed their antler growth and now they're hardening their antlers. And in some areas of the country, they may have already started shedding their velvet. Here in Mississippi, we're uh, starting to shed velvet. We'll have a few on camera now that, that have shed velvet, but most of them are still in velvet, finishing that hardening process. And, and that's all tied to testosterone levels. And, you know, I think most people are familiar with the bachelor groups during the summer. Bucks tend to hang out with other bucks. And part of the reason they do that is they're not influenced by testosterone. They're in a friendly, cheery they can tolerate other other bucks around them. Yeah, tolerate. Yeah, they're not that, wanting to fight. Yeah, and and so this is that time of year when the testosterone levels are now going out the roof, and they are changing, and it's uh, physically evidenced by the shed velvet, and then the musculature increasing on the neck, and their activity patterns change. 
so the summer home range of a buck from what you've seen is going to be far different than a fall winter home range typically they're they're looking for different things they're in the summertime it's all about nutrition and frankly conserving energy and avoiding uh, predation and avoiding predatory uh, biting insects I mean ticks mosquitoes horse flies there's a, there's a need to avoid blood loss during the summertime and so you know, a lot of people don't think about that, but that's an important facet of, of a deer's life is keeping their blood in their body. But that's I'm, I'm rambling there. Sorry. That's all right. You're, you're known to ramble, so we, we tolerate it. Um, what else? We kind of have some categorizations, uh, move, types of movement. We got the, the, I guess, more general accepted home range. Yeah. And, and home ranges are going to change throughout the year. Yeah. Um, and and you know, again, many people have probably heard this, but you know, a buck home range tends to be much larger than a does, uh, and the the amount of acreage varies with where it's been estimated and the method that they use to estimate it. But we like to say does are going to be, you know, a few hundred to six hundred acres across the year, whereas a buck is going to be a thousand to twelve hundred acres. So easily twice the size of the doe and that comes into that the idea that the buck is going to be searching for does ultimately and it needs to know more about the neighborhood than the doe is who's more sedentary and more about raising the fawns in a, in a confined area what about um this time of the year is also another classification that we call dispersal yes uh, dispersal is you know when a a young animal leaves its natal area or the area from associated with its mother. And it's most important for the male fawns to leave once they're weaned. And there's two periods during which they do that prior to reaching sexual maturity. Uh, around the time of uh, their first birthday, and that's you know, 10, 11, 12 months of age, that's a time when the doe is being more reclusive to have her next set of fawns and she doesn't really want to be bothered by her one-year-old son Son. yeah and she's ready to kick him out of the house she's going to be pretty irritable towards him and and a lot of times they'll leave then and move to a new area that's that initial dispersal and then by around a year and a half or you know 20 months of age these bucks that have moved away from their mothers and sometimes you'll see them during the hunting season where there's you'll see a doe and a uh, maybe a couple fawns or a yearling doe and then 200 yards away you'll see a yearling buck just kind of hanging around kind of you know being that dopey he still hadn't gotten the picture yet that yeah, he's he, not welcome anymore he's just he's not part of the picture anymore yeah. but he doesn't know it quite yet and but then during the fall uh, his testosterone's peaking, and he's interacting with other bucks, and he gets a little bit more of a wanderlust. And so that second dispersal is around 18, or from 16 to 20 months of age. So during between the the around 12 month of age, and then that 16 to 20 months of age, about 60 as much as 80 percent of the bucks leave their birth area, the home range of their mothers. And that means they're dispersing anywhere from two to three miles away. And and there's records of, you know, eight or nine, even 10 mile dispersals. Um, There's a pretty good relationship with how open the landscape is as well. Yeah. So a lot of it, like for comparison, if you went to the Midwest, the average dispersal distance is a lot more, Mm -hmm. a lot more than a few miles. It may be double digit miles or even more, Mm -hmm. but it's a product of the landscape. Yeah. Looking for available habitat. So we have these dispersals that are, you know, all about gene flow and making sure you don't breed your mother. That's the main thing. Yeah, minimize inbreeding. Yeah, uh, and then uh, there's there's other movements too that pretty much bucks and does make during the year that I think are really interesting, and uh, what we call excursions. And these are these short-term movements outside of your normal home range. And it's 
maybe for a day or two or three or four. Uh, and it could be great distances. Several miles is not untypical. And these excursions are, again, done by both bucks and does. They tend to peak uh, the greatest amount of bucks and does do them during the breeding season. So we you know, think it's probably tied to mate search, mm-hmm. uh, bucks going outside their normal home range looking for does. And, you know, we've had uh, a podcast earlier with Dan Marino, our, our uh, student, who showed that females do have a preference for males, antler size. And so the females are maybe leaving their home range looking for that big antlered buck. Or, yeah. Sc- scouting herself or leaving her calling card. Yeah. Yeah, just learning about the social network. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60% of bucks and does are going to make these excursions during the breeding season that are probably tied to breeding or searching for for a mate. But then other scientists uh, around the country have shown these excursions take place during the spring and summer as well. So uh, it's not all about breeding. These similar excursions, although it's a lower rate, anywhere from 20 to to 40 percent of of bucks and does who make springtime excursions. And here I think there's a different, maybe a different justification or reason for it. it has to do with not looking for mate, but looking for just opportunities for foraging, uh, places. Uh, scouting for a better place to live. Scouting for a better place to live. you got to know when you're, when you're in an environment that changes all the time, you have to have some knowledge of where to go when, when it changes. One thing I want to revisit back with dispersal, Steve, is, um, gosh, 20-plus years ago, um, a, a management technique that if you wanted to keep more yearling bucks on your property, you know, was, was to harvest the doe. So the assumption was that most all of the yearling buck dispersal was a product of maternal aggression. Um I do know in the last decade or so, I've seen some studies that didn't really support that. Uh, there wasn't clear evidence for mm-hmm. maternal aggression or not. Where, where do you stand on that now? And, and I thought you even did a similar study in Texas. Yeah, we had a South Texas study years ago, me and Bob Zaglin on the Piloncio. And uh, we orphaned some fawns and we left fawns with their mothers. And the buck fawns in particular that were orphaned tended to stay in that natal area, in that birthplace area. The fawns that we left with their mothers, the buck fawns, tended to disperse. So that would support the idea that, uh, you know, if you want to keep bucks around, go ahead and shoot their mothers, and the buck fawns will stay. Steve, I get a lot of, um, in fact, it was about literally about two weeks ago, uh, a buddy of mine sent me some photos. So they had a trail camera set up. It was obviously set up in a, in a great spot. And I believe it was seven bucks walking in single file. Of Don't course, you just love that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there was a really standout buck, um, a mature buck, you know, great antlers. Um, and so, of course, he's wanting to know what's the probability, you know, what are the chances of seeing this guy during hunting season and my reply was you need to hopefully harvest him on the very first day of bow season (laughs) because there's no chance where there's no telling where he's going to be a month from now and um that's something i guess i'd like to get a little bit more information about is i think we categorize summer home range bachelor groups and then in the fall and winter you know this buck sets up a new home range of course we know that when the rut gets going, he's going to be chasing does in and out of his home range. But what have you seen in terms of home range in the fall and winter? Is is after that bachelor group breaks up and those bucks move to their fall home range, are they going to be there until springtime? Or is that also going to be in flux all during the fall and winter? Deer move. And, and we put these artificial constraints and clocks and... and October 1st to October 30th is, is a, a time period because it's bow season. Well, deer don't know that. 
And, and they're always going to be in flux in terms of moving to address their needs, one way or one need or another. And uh, just because they switch from summer to fall, that, that's our artificial construct. So they're always moving, and it's just a matter of defining a time period and seeing what they're doing within that time period. For example, it's common to, uh, with trail cameras to focus and, and pattern a buck that he's coming out in this field uh, regularly in September, late September, early October. And we've done, uh, you know, we've mentioned our, our big buck movement project in, in central Mississippi earlier, and we're going to talk some more with some special people here in a few minutes about that. Um, but we've got uh, a large database on adult bucks and their movements, and we see different types of home range occupancy, but within all of those home ranges, regardless whether they have a single home range or a multiple home range, they all change their location within that seasonal home range. So let's say, for example, we plot a home range from October through January, the hunting season. You could say, uh, well, we, we've identified several personalities of bucks during this time period, and basically it's thirds. One third of the bucks are relatively sedentary, and they uh, sedentary meaning that they cover the home range maybe a thousand acres, but they're relatively consistent in the area that they live in during those uh, six months or five months. And then we have another group of a third of the bucks that are sedentary, but they're making excursions outside of these their home range. And then a third still that are uh, more uh, mobile, mobile bucks. And, and they are literally living in two or more home ranges during that five-month period. So it's like they have two families. They're, they're, living, they're living a double life. They're living a double life, kind of like you've seen in some of these movies or books where there's a guy that has a family in Oshkosh yeah. and then some a family other over in yeah. some other town and traveling salesman. What, what's the, um, so for those that are living the double life, how long are they in one segment and back to the other? Is that, are they going back and forth on a weekly, monthly? No, it's more of a, I'm here for two or three months, and then I'm going to leave, and I'm going to go somewhere else for the, the rest of the time. Uh, we've had a few that have gone back and forth a couple times, uh, but generally it's a, I'm living over here, and then I'm living over there. So when they're, when they're living over there, about, on average, about how big is that I don't know if you want to call it a home range. It might be a monthly home range. How big is that area? At least half of the normal size of the home range. And, and we haven't really started running as many home, the, all the home range metrics yeah. on our, our data. We're looking more at distribution of points, mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. locations, not home range per se. So uh, can we avoid saying home range sizes? Can I just play dumb on that question? I'm going to refer yeah. that question to Ashley and Colby here in a few minutes. Let's say that again um, or reemphasize this. So you're saying what we've seen so far, there's essentially three types of site fidelity. There's going to be the typical historical, what we've always thought of, that generally over the course of fall and winter, here's a buck's going to hang out on this thousand acres. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to have, on the other end of the spectrum, we're going to have one that hangs out for a month here, hangs out for a month there, and then hangs out for a month over there as well. So the, 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 the fidelity to the site might vary by month or six weeks or something like that. Yeah, a little, little longer than a, a little month. Longer it's more than like that. two or three months and then okay. move in two or three months somewhere else. And then kind of in the middle, we have this buck that's kind of showing the site fidelity for this 800,000, 1,200 acres, but he's making excursions throughout that time period. Yes. Okay. And, and then back to, you know, those, those bucks that are patterned in September, October, you know, if you've got one of these mobile bucks that are, he may be living there in September and October, November, and then he picks up and moves to his other town, he's totally out of the 
out of the you know the area. Uh, but even our sedentary bucks that are pretty stationary in terms of a general home range, you know, it might be a thousand acres, but it's pretty consistent over that five month period. He's got one home range. Even those bucks, if you look, if you plot the data on a monthly basis, October, November, December, January, and, and color code those, you see major shifts in the distribution of the colors. So where he's living in October isn't going to be where he's living in December. November might be kind of shifted in between those two. So there's this home range that's relatively sedentary, but he's moving around, redistributing within that home range. But he has emphasis areas, so to speak. Yes. He's just spending more time in a portion of his home range, and that could be due to a lot of different things. It could be due to food availability. It might be due to some type of social pressure. It might be due to human disturbance, and that's some of the things we hope to examine in this research project to maybe figure out things like that. Mm -hmm. But regardless of the cause, they're doing it. All bucks are always moving. Some of them have patterns. Well, they all have some kind of larger scale pattern. And then they have smaller patterns within their home ranges. And then within even smaller than that scale, within the home range scale, they have what we might call focal areas. And, and Aaron Foley in Texas, our friend, Texas A&M Kingsville is you know, looked at the area, the idea of focal areas during the breeding season several years ago, and he showed that, you know, bucks tended to have two to three focal areas within their home range during the breeding season, and they typically just traveled between these two or three focal areas, and they didn't use the whole area of their home range, they just moved between these focal areas, and he, he and, and our friend Randy and Dave Hewitt, uh, they hypothesized that these bucks were going to potential areas where there were does, checking them out, and then moving on and coming back. And these were smaller areas, and they were going to relatively short-term periods. And these are different from excursions. Okay, well, co contrast that then. An excursion would be, give me some amount of time. Is that a three-day round trip, two-day round yeah. trip? Yeah, excursion is a two- to seven-day trip out somewhere and back. Exploring. Yes, and may not go back to that spot for a year. Okay. Whereas a focal area would be distinguished by that's going to be some place they visit again and again, yes. some period of time. Yes, during, say, the breeding season. And, and maybe we should introduce our, our guests right about now because we really need their help to, to... Dig us out of a hole here. Yeah. Ashley Jones is a graduate student at the at the Deer Lab here, and she is a native of Wisconsin. Minnesota, Wisconsin. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I was wanna... schooled in Wisconsin. I hail schooled. both of them as home. Okay, well, welcome, Ashley. And, and really, tell us where you were before you came to Mississippi. Well, before Mississippi, I actually worked all over the country on short-term technician jobs doing uh, various deer research projects, um, but most recently in the two years before I arrived in Mississippi, I was serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa in the country of Ghana. So I was, I was used to the heat by the time I arrived down here. Yeah. Good conditioning. Yeah. Heat conditioning. Definitely. So anyway, we're happy that she came. She made a, would we call this, well, we don't know yet. Is it a seasonal migration for a couple of years? Is it a a one-way dispersal? Is she going to just hang around here long? We don't know yet. We don't know it, if she's setting up a new home range here for a long time to come. Or? Move, movement, you know, it, we're always moving. Mm -hmm. So the only time will tell. We'll, we'll, we won't put any artificial construct around the time frame. She's here right now. We're happy to have her. And we also have Colby Henderson, who is uh, relatively newer than Ashley. Ashley came in uh, about... Two, a little over two years ago. A little over two years ago to start the project down in Madison, Yazoo County, central Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, ran the project completely by herself for the pretty much the first year. And then we were able to add Colby on as, as a second graduate student. And Colby's got uh, 
more of a sedentary kind of a buck. He's from Mississippi and, and uh, actually grew up in Starkville, here, home of the Bulldogs. Yep, I'm from right here uh, in Starkville, and I still remember when you took me out to the MSU deer pens when I was like eight years old or something. Yeah. You went to the church I was in, so yeah. I've, I enjoyed it then, and I still enjoy it now. It was great. We, I baited you in with a little uh, behavioral interaction at the deer pens, and, and glad we could capture you for this time frame of your life. So we have these two graduate students that are working on mature bucks, or uh, they're not all mature, they're adult bucks. Their average age is what, about four years of age? Four and a half, yep. Four and a half years of age. Y'all spend hours and hours and nights and nights. We have a team down there now. And in fact, after this, uh, well, we'll we'll do this podcast today, uh, and then uh, tomorrow they'll head back down to continue working with the capture crew to capture some more bucks. So why don't y'all um, tell everybody about how you're capturing? I think most people would find that real interesting. So real general, I know there's a few different techniques, but in general, how are you capturing? And um, what have been some of the, the big hurdles you've had to face? Yeah, I guess I can start us off. Uh, well, in the first year, like Dr. Damaris alluded to, I was running a crew of... I think we had four technicians um, and myself and so we were down there 24 7 trying to catch bucks any way we could think of and we started using uh, these contraptions called a drop net it's about 60 square feet of net suspended in the air and we baited it with corn and then you sit in a little blind with a remote trigger and try to drop the net when you get uh, bucks on bait and we just a lot of headaches associated with that. Um, it's a really effective way to catch a lot of deer if you are start trying to study does or fawns or even yearling bucks. But we were doing this during uh, the hunting season, during the rut, and so it was a lot of work uh, to set up a net and then get one mature buck under the net. So we quickly transitioned to darting our deer, um, and we do that. It's pretty similar to bow hunting in a lot of respects. Uh, We dart at about 20 yards. We sit out in the evening and go on into the night and Colby can elaborate a little bit more on that process. So yeah, as Ashley said, we sit there in the night uh, and we have a bait pile out and we're waiting for a mature or a older buck to come into the bait pile and once they give us a correct shot, we use the uh, dart rifle to shoot a dart with the transmitter uh, also carrying the drugs to put the deer to sleep and then hopefully we hit them when we shoot and then the dart will sit or sit into the uh, back leg of the deer and they'll run off and we'll use a it's called a yagi or it the dart will transmit a radio signal and we'll follow that signal until we get to the deer and the deer by then is laying down asleep and then that's when we start putting the collar on it and ear tags and everything else we do. Now, Yagi is a directional antenna, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you hone in on the signal from the dart that's attached to the deer. Yes. Now, how do you see them at night? Well, we use uh, night vision or really infrared scopes or infrared uh, goggles. So we put out a floodlight that is using infrared light so as humans we can't see it It, it's still dark out if you don't have the goggles on or the the, uh, scope but when you have the goggles on or you're looking through the scope it's lit up just like daytime Uh, it's a little green so it's a little difficult to you don't have as clear vision but it's very easy to see it's like the sun's out almost sounds like it's really easy to capture these bucks at night isn't it you just get to deer hunt. Is that basically what you're doing? Ashley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is basically what we're doing uh, with, you know, a little bit different payoff, I guess you could think about. We're not taking antlers home. We're trying to leave everything we capture where we found it and see where it goes. And it's really not easy. I mean, the fact that we're putting out bait and we're doing it at night with night vision, I mean, it's still tough how many nights have y'all how many night 
person nights have you been this this summer so far in early fall and how many bucks have you caught this summer alone we've probably been out i could probably a hundred person nights and we've captured five bucks um I would say that over the course of this project, if I were to put a dollar amount on every buck that we've collared, Ooh, we don't want to do that. It would be a lot, and if we put a time <laughs> amount on every buck that we collared, it would be it would be huge. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a very large effort that goes into capturing these deer. Yeah, this research is difficult and expensive. Luckily, we have a, a great state wildlife agency, Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks greatly supportive of our need to do research and we are their research arm and federal aid to wildlife restoration funds which is the federal excise tax on guns and ammunition that the state agency gets some of that money back and they can use some of that for research and so we have a great relationship and this project is funded that way and and it's a topic of supreme importance to hunters absolutely this is a hunter driven question yeah this the overall project topics are how do uh, hunter activity affect buck movements during the hunting season and tied into that is how do food resources particularly acorns massed during the hunting season affect their movements and so the agency needed the answers and they came to us the deer lab because we're the answer guys and then but we're not the work guys so then we had to find these Two really dedicated, intelligent, hardworking... All-stars. All-stars to yes. do the work. Okay, Ashley, so let's get um, a little more detail on what you've been finding. I know you're just kind of at the beginning stages of all this research you're doing, and of course you're going to be looking at uh, hunter uh, disturbance or hunter input, lots of different things. But um, initially you've been focusing on focal areas. And so could you kind of bring everyone up to speed on what you're, you're seeing here in Mississippi? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, so with our preliminary data, we wanted to examine folk layers because, as Dr. Damaris mentioned earlier, that's something that had been looked at in Texas um, with mature bucks there. So we thought it would be interesting to try to draw some comparisons and see if our bucks in Mississippi were behaving similarly. Um, so what we found was that Basically, in a nutshell, bucks in Mississippi are much more repetitive movers than bucks in Texas. Um, We found that, you know, in Texas, about half of their deer were doing this repetitive back and forth movement from one location to another, or potentially two or three locations. And you mean bucks when you say being repetitive? Yes. Okay. Yep. And they were doing that on roughly a daily basis, so 20 to 28 hours. Uh, In Mississippi, we found that almost all of our bucks are showing these repetitive movements. Again, some of them are within within an overall sedentary home range, like Doc mentioned earlier. Um, But they're revisiting these specific areas very frequently. 74% of them are doing this on a 6 to 10 hour basis. Um, So super, super repetitive movements. um, And... And some of this has to be going on during daylight hours. Absolutely. So hunter opportunities here. Exactly. So if you as a hunter can identify one of these focal areas, and I can can go into a little bit how we've gone about identifying them. Yeah, please do. If you can position yourself there, you can expect to see that buck, you know, if not in the morning, maybe in the evening. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. How does that that contrast with the classic or typical southern hunting approach? A little more detail. Okay, yeah, kind of broad, vague question. Many hunters in the south, at least, they go out and hunt in the morning, stay in the stand for two or three hours, they take a midday break, go back to the camp, have lunch, maybe take a nap, watch a football game if it's a Saturday or a Sunday, then they go back out for the afternoon hunt. How, How does that strategy... How is that basically bad relative to, Ashley, what you were just saying? Missed opportunity. Yeah, definitely. So depending on the time of day that these movements are occurring, you might just be, you know, walking in the door as he's walking out, so to speak. Um, So 
I guess I can walk through how we identify these areas because you get bucks on camera in a lot of different places, right? So how do you know if it's a focal area? Um, the way that we went about identifying this was using some somewhat sophisticated science, but in general, we looked at movement characteristics of the deer and determined areas where they were exhibiting what we would call concentrated movements. So you can think about it, if we were tracking you and you went for your daily jog, or maybe for some it's weekly. <laughs> or annual. Or annual, yeah. yeah. If you went for your annual jog, or say you were going grocery shopping, you know, up and down the aisles in the grocery store, we can see that there's clear differences in those movements. One is very linear, relatively fast. The other is slow with a lot more turning. Um, so we can characterize deer movements in the same way, and we're looking for those areas where they're grocery shopping, or potentially they're in a bar trying to meet a doe. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what's holding them there, but we've keyed in on those areas, and those are the places that they're making these repetitive movements to and from. That is very interesting. Yeah. And so you said like 70% or so, or every six or seven hours? Yep, 75% are six to 10 hours another 26%, so basically the remaining animals that are doing this, which again is basically all of ours, are between three and 5.9 hours, so even quicker. Okay, so if you're on a stand and you get up after three hours, you're, a th you know, that 25% of the bucks, they may be coming back to their focal area right when you're getting up and you just blew it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I'm a sedentary hunter. I, I, I I grew up, you took your sandwich with you and your bottle of water. You went into the woods for the day. Before dark, before the sun came up, you went in and you were sitting in some place watching the sunrise, and you came out after the sun set. But unfortunately, back in your day, there were no bucks. Yes, that's right. And, and don't ask me how successful I was. But you still got to hit them. I, yes, yeah. you have to hit them. You can't miss them. You have to. You can't be stoop, Do stupid things. Mm -hmm. This is before I learned a lot about right the deer biology. You had more time back in those days. But I, I feel like looking back, I at least put the right amount of effort in. I was in the woods all day, mm -hmm. and I saw that you know deer during the middle of the day when I that I wouldn't have seen if I had left. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of, of hunters. We tend to be really kind of lazy. We we just want to put in our couple three hours, and then go do something else, and then come back and and think the deer are on our schedule, and they're not. Yeah, but Steve, sometimes you have obligations. Sometimes you can't spend a whole day in the field. Okay. You know? Okay. You know? Yeah. Some people got to work. Yeah. So if I can just go grab a morning, it's better than not having any experience oh, at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just saying that you're missing opportunities. If you can yep. be in the woods all day, stick it out because these bucks are moving more than you think and you're going to miss out. But yeah, definitely. And that's know. one of my favorite things. I, I, I probably only get to do it, I, have, I didn't even do it last year, um, but probably my favorite thing to do is during the rut and doing exactly what you're describing, to be in a, um, I like a climbing stand. My climbing stand's really comfortable. And I can take a thermos of coffee and water and sandwich and go the entire day. And that's, uh, that, that really is my, my, my favorite thing to do. And when I look back at um, some of my hunts, there was obviously a flurry of activity at dawn and dusk. But you would see bucks all day long moving back and forth. So I do not disagree with, with you whatsoever. Yeah. I just wish I had more time to do it yeah. nowadays. Any two hours on a stand is better than... Two hours in the office. Yeah. Okay, Ashley. So I'm, I'm trying to think of what a listener might be thinking right now. Is It is really advantageous to locate a focal area. Most people don't have access to bucks with GPS collars around their neck. So they're going to be having to, either through a gridded trail camera system or maybe identifying habitat characteristics. Are there any at least generalities that you've seen so far that might give someone some insight as to what could be a focal area? Absolutely. Um, this is, again, speaking specifically for our deer here in Mississippi. This may look different in other parts of the country, uh, but about half 
of these focal areas are made up of what we call bottomland hardwoods and another quarter of them are made up of a combination of pasture and cultivated cropland. You know, that can vary from individual to individual, but those are the largely the composition that we have. And we want to be careful, though, that the listener doesn't think, oh, well, I need to hunt in bottomland hardwoods or pasture land to, to find a focal area. Those are just the habitat characteristics where these focal areas occurred, which are very site-specific to our study areas. It's a predominantly bottomland hardwoods with agriculture, uh, fields, and, and some pines. Uh, I just want to clarify that. More important than the general habitat that they occur in, you know, the habitat types is just, you know, that's the town you live in. Where do you really spend, what, what are the, what's it like where you actually live? And, and so their focal areas are in the bottomland hardwoods, but really for a hunter to figure out where that focal area might be to, to set up a stand near it, to catch the buck coming in and out of that focal area, what are the features of the habitat that they need to look at? And that's what Colby has looked at most recently is going in and, and finding the center of these focal areas and doing vegetation sampling during uh, February. And these, these are you know, winter vegetation characteristics. And, and, and let's, let's emphasize, too, here that the focal areas were during the hunting season. Uh, was it November? Well, hunting season, breeding season, November, December, January, and February. Yep. And, and so in February, uh, Colby and went in with a team... I went one day. Mm-hmm. I, that was all you could take, huh? Yeah, I did my mm-hmm. part. Uh, and uh, Colby, w- tell us a little bit what you did to sample the vegetation from a, to understand it from a, a deer standpoint. So, as Ashley said, you know, we have these focal areas that these deer are using, uh, but we wanted to look at what type of vegetation they're using within these focal areas. Uh, so we determined areas that were heavily used by our deer with these collars on them and then areas that were unused uh, by the deer. And then, as Dr. Damaris was saying, we went into these areas and specifically measured types of vegetation. Uh, we used, for example, a uh, tape measure on the ground. And every time a piece of vegetation was over that tape measure, we measured or we counted how long of the tape measure was covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we also use something such as a NUDS board, uh, which is you use to determine cover in an area. Uh, so first and foremost, we looked at, or with this cover, the used areas of our bucks had 50% more screening cover. So in areas that the bucks were using, there was more vegetation to hide them from the sight of a predator or a hunter that was in the field. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily what tell us what type of vegetation they're using for cover. So then we also looked at different vegetation classes. So for the used areas of our bucks, uh, used areas had 120% more herbaceous cover. And now this herbaceous cover is important not only because it's providing cover, but it's also providing food for them to eat. So just like Dr. Strickland was saying how he wants to bring a sandwich in the stand with him, these bucks are choosing areas where not only they feel safe, uh, from sight from a hunter, but they're also having food there to eat, so they don't have to leave an area to go to a potentially dangerous dangerous area. Hey, Colby, can you give some examples of what, what would be cover that you could eat, or that a buck could eat? So, uh, cover that the bucks were using that they would eat were things uh, such as several uh, native season type grasses, or what some people like to call weeds, uh, you know, little herbaceous or forb plants, partridge pea, uh, goldenrod, things like that that Mm -hmm. people don't really think of deer using, but they definitely can use it for cover, but they'll also use it to snack on while they're there. And and that stuff can easily be, depending on which plant you're talking about, three to six foot high. Yes, yeah. So So we measured it from all the way from zero uh, inches above the ground all the way up to three feet above the ground. Mm-hmm. or three meters above the ground. Uh, and generally used areas had about a meter and a, or a yard and a half of herbaceous cover or cover in general within the used area. Okay. 
So you're, you're talking about two different kinds of variables that you're measuring. One is the screening cover, which basically refers to the thickness of the vegetation, the ability of it to hide the animal. And then, uh, and that's with the NUDS boards, which is basically like a, a, a one by six board that's six feet tall and painted white and black and, and alternating um, sections so you can kind of see what percentage of it can you see at different height increments. It's like someone holding up a piece of wood and someone else is looking at the piece of wood to see how much of that wood they can see. And the less they can see, the more screening cover that is located in that area. And so the, the more screening cover, the less able you are to see the deer that's in it. Yes, and the safer the deer feels because a hunter can't see that deer. Okay, and, and as Colby pointed out, that's not uh, anything but physical breakup. But then the other variables you looked at, the, the, the line transect method you used, the amount of leaf area that's covering the tape is more the forage plants that also physically make up the screening cover. Yeah. So it's two different things here, but they're both important. And that's the neat thing about a deer. He can get his cover from predators as well as eat. One-stop shop. He doesn't have to leave. He can stay in that area and get multiple needs, which why would a deer not? Why would a deer oh, yeah. choose an area where they have to leave to get something else? Right. Choose Perfectly with advantageous everything. to him. To have food and cover to be the, the same structure, yeah. yeah. Like like a really intelligent hunter was talking a few minutes ago about how he, he loved to go out and get in his climbing stand and he'd bring his sandwich with him and his water bottle. Same thing. W- were you talking about me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing I'd, I'm not clear on. So Ashley, just in general, when you think, for your analysis, when you think of a focal area... What's your spatial scale there? Is that acres? Is that hundreds of acres? That's tough. I think, so it varies by individual, of course. Um, But we're talking on the scale less than 100 acres, more than 20. Okay. 20 plus acres, less than 100. Yeah, generally. And then when Colby, when you're really diving into specifically... I mean, where is the buck bedded or standing and feeding, remaining in cover? You're talking about a scale of far less than an acre. We're talking about a 50 meter by 50 meter grid. And that's how we gridded it out to determine areas we needed to sample is we created a 50 meter by 50 meter grid, which is not very big. Right, Uh, right. I mean, you could easily see all the way across it. Yeah, 50 yards by 50 yards. So let's circle back to where... When I asked Ashley to kind of characterize the focal area, um, you really kind of identified at a broad scale, like you said, there was forest land, in this case, bottomland hardwood, and I think you said field. I don't know if that was agriculture or food plot, but field. So basically, broadly, food and cover, but essentially then within the forest, in this case, bottomland hardwood, you're going to find probably openings in the canopy, gaps in the canopy where sunlight has developed um, vegetation on the forest floor and that's where you're finding these bucks bedded and hiding. Yes, within these focal areas. So that kind of leads to some management objectives. Yeah. If you want to create more focal areas on your property, at least places where bucks are going to hang out and bed is you've got to develop the understory. Cover. Physical screening cover, and so, some of us is, is uh, used heavily used areas were actually in, in downed trees, so dead treetops. Yes. So it's not just all about food; it's about that physical screening cover. But if you can combine physical screening cover with food, then you've got the best of both worlds. So, in, in your example about opening uh, the canopy. Part of that opening of the canopy could involve some uh, mid-story tree removal. And in the process, you're making some mineral stumps. And then you cluster the The treetops treetops to make physical hiding structure Mm -hmm. in a a small, small area. Then you've created a focal area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and this information, it, it just takes me back to 
over the years spending a lot of time in our Delta region, which is our ag region. And I always come away when I hunt a weekend there saying food is so abundant and cover is so limited. And so you'll work with some hunters and managers over there and and they kind of ask the question, I don't see any bucks on my property. Where did the deer go? And you're looking across the landscape and it's obvious to me you don't have any cover. You don't have any cover to hold a buck on your property. Coincidentally, them, Steve, when we're in other parts of the state, deer aren't cover limited whatsoever. They're food limited. Mm-hmm. So there's just such a context based on, on where you're at as to what the management need is going to be. Yes. Okay, um, Ashley, I want to bounce back to you. So if we're providing, and, and Colby too, I guess, with this, um, if we're providing a buck with cover and that cover is simultaneously providing food, is a hunter going to sit here and say, well, I'm never going to see him. I provided everything, but but actually the data shows that you can still see them. They are still going to move, of course, especially during the breeding season. Or, or am I misinterpreting? No, absolutely. I think if you can key in on an area where you can identify characteristics that a buck wants to spend time in, you're going to be trying to catch him on his way in or out of there. And even if it supplies cover and food, there's another resource during a part of the year that's really important, and that's does. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be moving, as we've talked about already, in and out of there no matter what, and that's what you're trying to key in on as a hunter. Well, folks, thank you very much. We are, yeah, we're going to be close to an hour here. So we had a very good discussion today. Um, I think some take-home points for me is that, number one, this is really cutting edge and it's very interesting and I can't wait for us to do it again as we learn more. Um, I'm more and more impressed with kind of the small scale management someone can do. Uh, You do not have to, you know, in terms of habitat management, does not have to be on the scale of 50 acres and 100 acres from what Colby described. Anytime you can go out and take out a few trees, get some sunlight on the floor, Um, you can positively influence deer movement, buck movement on your property. Absolutely. Um, And Steve, why don't you wrap up with some of your take-home points generally from... Well, I I think it's important to just keep in mind that bucks are going to be moving all the time. Uh, Throughout, from month to month, week to week, they're going to be shifting in the resources that they use across the landscape, but they're going to have the key to to being successful in hunting is to understand the resources that they're looking for, create those resources in as many places on your property, and then hunt hard along associated with those resources. So Colby has identified the structure and the food supply that's critical to the focal areas that Ashley's identified, and it's small scale small scale stuff. We talked about the thousand acre home range of bucks. You don't have to manage a thousand acres. You don't have to be on a thousand acres. You just have to create those focal areas that are targets of the movement of the buck. They're going to come back, particularly in the south now. We know from Ashley's work, they're going to come back regularly. And most all of them are going to be moving in in that same kind of pattern, looking for their focal areas. Create it and they will come. And then I guess in the future, to add to that and to maybe test some of that, we're going to be looking at the the impact of hunters on buck movements. We'll be able to quantify that more. So that'll be the next piece of the puzzle. Yes, and that's going to be so exciting to see the real, the fruit, the full fruit of these two young people's efforts and a lot of people helping them uh, bear fruit. The collars fall off March 1st. 2019, after two and a half years on the Bucks. Ashley will be pitching a party that day. <laughs> we're we're going to have a party for knee, you that day. I'll be knee deep in the swamp that day. Oh, so when colors. you get back, we'll have a party <laughs> waiting on you. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Steve, Ashley, Colby, had a great time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having us. We're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management. 
If you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education. Thank you.